Beauty and Sanctuary with Emma Newman. Hello my lovelies and welcome to episode two of season two of Tea and Sanctuary. So I'm still getting used to the camera thing, but I'm not going to worry about that now. I, I've got a list of things that I want to talk about today. And as I was compiling them, I was thinking, oh, do I need to put a thing in between each section and blah, 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 blah. And I think I mentioned in the last episode that I recorded about how I'd been kind of overthinking this podcast. That in season one, I had all of those different categories and it just made a lot of work. And I've been thinking about what podcasts are for, <laughs> you know, not a, not a small topic, but um, obviously they're for lots and lots and lots of re different reasons. But I was thinking about what I want this podcast to be for. And I was talking to a very dear friend of mine about podcasts, and he talked about how they're quite an intimate form of communication because it's just you talking to the listener. And the, my aim for this podcast has always been to create a space which is really cosy and comforting and safe. And having different topics and bits of music between each one isn't really needed for that. So I think one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is the barriers to creating a podcast for me personally. And the two major ones are time, because I do a lot of things. There are a lot of demands on my time and it's hard to fit this in. But when I really am truthful with myself, I think it's because of that aspect of intimacy that I'm quite scared of people. And, um, I I think I've been hiding again and I, I do this. I kind of pop up and then do loads of things and then I run away and hide again. And so one of the reasons I'm massively simplifying this format is to reduce one of those barriers in the hope that it will make it easier for me to overcome the the nerves, to give myself fewer excuses. If I have a format that involves lots of different topics and categories and uh, fiddling about with the editing, then it's more likely that I will tell myself, well, I don't really have the time, which is partly true, but I can make time for this and I should make time for this. And in all honesty, I've just been hiding. And the reason I'm talking about this is not just to kind of explain my thoughts and feelings around creating this podcast to be open and honest with you about it. It's also because of an experience I had a couple of weeks ago, and it was genuinely one of the exci most exciting days I've had in such a long time. <laughs> I went to see Sir Patrick Stewart at the Swan Theatre in Stratford-upon-Avon talking about his book. He's recently published a memoir, and he's been doing lots of different events where he goes and has a conversation with someone for an hour. And a few weeks ago, I saw this come up um, on his Instagram, I think. I think I follow him in on Instagram. And there were two dates that were announced. One was at the South Bank, um, the National Theatre, I think it was, in London. And the other was up in Huddersfield. Now, both of those locations are quite a long way away, but it's much easier to get to London from where I live than Huddersfield. But the problem was, is that the London date clashed with one of my besties 50th birthday party. And it was then I realised how much I love her because I was thinking I can't go to see Patrick Stewart because it clashes with her birthday party. <laughs> and that sounds ridiculous, but... Honestly, being able to see Sir Patrick Stewart in the real world is something which I wanted to do so much. It was so important to me. And, you know, bless him, he's getting on a bit and he may not be able to do another tour. So I was absolutely gutted that I couldn't go. 
I even put myself on the waiting list for the Huddersfield event, thinking that if something came up, I would go to it. Anyway, <laughs> funnily enough, a slot came up on the waiting list for Huddersfield, but it was only announced the afternoon of that evening's performance, and there was no way that I could physically get there in time. Anyway, I was noodling around online one evening and he mentioned that he was going to be in Stratford and I was like, what? So I raced to the website for the Royal Shakespeare Company, theatre, whatever, and there were like four places left and I just got one. And I, I really don't do stuff on the spur of, of the moment. I don't. And this was one of the very rare occasions that I did it. And I bought a ticket. It was a standing like they have um, around the edge of the theatre, the Swan Theatre is the smaller one. They have these um, seats on the balconies and then they have like on a step behind them standing positions. And uh, so I was up in the gods, miles away from the stage, but I really wanted to go. So I went, I took myself to Stratford for the afternoon and I had a little bimble around the town and it was weird because it's I've never actually been into the town before and there was a food festival on and it was really busy. But I was just like killing time before I could go and see. Um, I was going to say go and see my space dad because that's what I call him, <laughs> which is ridiculous because obviously he's an actor and Captain Picard is just one of the many, many roles that he's played but that's, I can't disassociate him from Captain Picard. And Captain Picard is one of the most important characters in my kind of, I was going to say in my life. That makes it sound very grand. But in terms of the, the media that I've consumed over my life, it's one of the most important characters. Data is another one. I'm, of course, talking about Star Trek The Next Generation in case you're listening and going, what on earth is this woman talking about? Though, surely, surely you've you've heard of Captain Picard. Anyway, it was really important to me to go and I had a nice wander around. I went down to the theatre because there's the river there and it was beautiful and it was a really beautiful autumn day and, and I loved it. I just loved taking in the sights and sounds of the place and then waited until the theatre opened. It opened to let people in and I was like right there at the door. And I honestly, my heart rate was insane. When I went into the theatre and went and found my place, I was like one of the first people in the theatre. And I, I must think, I think my heart rate must have been over 100. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> Honestly, when I look back on it, I think, oh, that's quite ridiculous. But it was so worth it. I'm so glad I went. He was so warm and personable and funny. And it just felt really magical to be in the same room as him. And the, the sheer emotion the sheer kind of intensity of emotion, I should say, of that experience really made me think about parasocial relationships and how whilst I was standing there listening to him talking, I was desperate to ask him questions and talk to him because he's such an important figure in my mind. And I'm not just talking about the Captain Picard aspect. I really love how he's spoken up about domestic violence and I love how just utterly lovely he was to Elliot Page online when there were lots of people who were not. And I love how he's always encouraged people, in particular encouraged men, to feel comfortable kissing their male friends and saying that they love them. And one of my favourite moments, 
in the conversation with the interviewer was when it was getting to the end and the interviewer was like, oh, I haven't had time to ask you about so many things I wanted to. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was your decades long romance with Serene McKellen. And there was this just the most beautiful smile on Patrick Stewart's face. And he he put his hands over his heart like he was holding on to the love that was trying to burst out of his heart just at the mention of one of his best friends. And that moment of just the, the purest love and affection was just so gorgeous. You know, those those are the reasons why I wanted to see him so much as well. And obviously he played Professor X and and he's just awesome and he has a gorgeous voice and and he's just a brilliant actor. And funny enough, I watched him recently in I, Claudius before I went to see him at the theatre and he was great in that. And it was it was just a really intense experience becoming aware of how much I wanted to talk to him and being aware of that huge gulf between him being someone so important to me and me being a tiny face in a huge crowd, that discrepancy. And I was thinking about how weird and unnatural that is for human beings, right? Like, parasocial relationships are not anything new, but I think people are more aware of them than they used to be and perhaps talk about them more openly than they used to. And I've certainly seen several people on YouTube that I watch talk about it. I think Abigail Thorne talked about it. I don't know if she did a whole episode on it or whether it just came up in an episode. I can't remember. And the idea that you can have such intense feelings for somebody that doesn't know you exist or or only knows of you as part of a nebulous group, like he knows that he has thousands upon thousands of fans. He knows that he has thousands upon thousands of Star Trek focused fans. And he knows he has so many fans of his Shakespearean work. But that that difference between the two really struck me. And then the thing that really weirded me out <laughs> was that I have that experience in a minuscule amount compared to his as somebody who writes books and does podcasts and does public appearances. And when I've gone to conventions, I've had people be really excited to meet me. And I've always found it really discombobulating because it's like, why, why are you excited to meet me? I'm just me. I'm not, I really don't have a very high opinion of myself. And so this is really confusing. But there are authors I've met and I've I've just like really nearly died when I've met them. <laughs> like it's really embarrassing levels of excitement. Am I going to tell this story? I'm going to tell this story right. So years and years and years ago, at my one of my favourite bookshops. I have many bookshops that I'm very fond of, but I think probably still my favourite bookshop is Mr B's Emporium in Bath, I think Mr. B's Emporium of Reading Delights. It's just gorgeous. I love it so much. I put it in one of my books. It's in the Split World series as a location, both in the real world and the nether. That's how much I love this book, this bookshop. And years ago, I think it might even have been before I was published. Yeah. So this is over 10 years ago. Maybe, maybe I'd had some short stories published. I don't remember. Anyway, it was a long time ago. And uh, China Mievel went and did a talk there. I think... I can't remember which book had just come out, but I remember getting Embassy Town signed. So it was... I think it was around the time of Embassy Town. And I, I love his work and have read lo loads of his books. I loved Embassy Town. I loved Perdido Street Station in particular. And um, and yes, I have a little bit of a crush on him. So I went to this event and I took all of the books I had of his to get signed. I was one of those people in the queue with this huge stack of books because bless him, he doesn't write small books, does he? So it was a big pile. And <laughs> as I was in 
the queue waiting to get them signed. That moment of meeting him, really, I got very flustered and nervous. And yeah, I got to the point where he was signing the books and I was just so red. I blush, I blush horribly when um, we're meeting people that I am a huge fan of. And I really was not very coherent. And then my friend who was there with me said, oh, well, let's get a picture of you taken together. And I don't know why I said yes, because I am the least photogenic person in the Northern Hemisphere. And it doesn't matter what I do. I just look awful in pictures. And <laughs> she took this picture, which will never leave my hard drive, because he's there looking like himself, perfectly normal. And I am there looking like a sunburnt version of the Joker. I have this incredible rictus grin and I'm bright red and I mean scarlet red. Oh my goodness. And that is a parasocial relationship, right? And to think that there have been people who have met me. I've seen people blush. I've seen people not be able to speak like comfortably. And it's really freaked me out because I just, I can't, I can't imagine somebody feeling the way about me that I feel about China Mieville or Gail Carragher um, years ago. Um, she was a guest of honour at EasterCon and I took all of the soulless books for her to sign and I was a complete mess, a mess when I first met her. Um, and now, years later, I've narrated audiobooks for her. Uh, it just absolutely blows my mind. <laughs> I'm just like, it just completely blows my mind. Honestly, one of the best moments of my entire life was when we crossed over a lobby. I think it was, it might have been a later Easter con. And she yelled out that she loved Tea in Jeopardy, the, the podcast I had before. And I honestly, I nearly died. And I think I had a workshop that I was teaching straight afterwards. And I went there and I was all flushed and all discombobulated. And I think I said to people that they were going to have to give me a minute because Gail Carragher just said that she loved my podcast. <laughs> and, and I seem to remember that people in the room were like, yeah, I, I would be absolutely blown away by that too. Yeah, take a minute. <laughs> so yeah, it was a weird experience going there and just feeling so intensely emotional about being in the same room as Sir Patrick Stewart. And not being able to tell him. And I was just desperate to tell him what his work playing Captain Picard meant to me. And I wanted to thank him for all of the wonderful things he said around Star Trek. And, and I know that he, like so many other people who have been in Star Trek, have been frustrated by that weird attention that Star Trek fans can give actors. I know that he's been frustrated in the past when he's gone on to do Shakespearean performances after his stint on Star Trek and people turning up in Star Trek uniforms and it just feeling desperately inappropriate at that moment. And I can, I can understand that, but I also equally understand the people going in cosplay. I understand that. I'm in that world too. I can see both sides of it and I, I have nothing but love for all of the parties involved in that, even though it, it he's expressed discomfort about it in the past. I don't know if he still feels that way. This is something I read he, he said years and years ago. But the the experience of seeing him was amazing. And, and the other amazing moment from that trip was that afterwards I went outside and the stage door area was to the left and they'd like barricaded off an area to, because they, you know, he's a big deal. I guess they were worried about people just kind of swamping the stage door. And they um, 
they'd put all these barriers and there were a few people, I don't know, 30, 40 people waiting at the barrier. And I could see the bonnet of a black car and I thought, oh, they must have picked him up. He must be going already. And I'd, I was sad that I'd missed my opportunity to perhaps see him or meet him briefly. I didn't know what the plan was. But then the car moved forwards and he was driving it. And I had been so high up in the theatre that most of the time that I was there, I'd only seen the top of his head. And I was suddenly at the same level that he was and like, you know, four or five metres away. And he saw everybody at the barriers because I'd gone up to the, the barrier as well to see him. And he could see us all there. And he wound, he stopped the car and wound the window down and waved at us and said, thank you. And we were all applauding and we all went, thank you. And it was the most British moment I have ever had. <laughs> we were all just so polite and so delighted. It was hilarious. It was it was just such a beautiful moment. And I could just feel everybody there as we were saying thank you to him, that it felt like we were just saying thank you. Thank you for, you know, the lifetime of performances that have delighted us. Thank you for being so lovely. Thank you for writing this memoir that we haven't read yet because we've literally just picked up our copy. I felt like I was finally able to say thank you to him. And it was beautiful. So that was a lovely day. Before I go any further, here's a big thank you to my gorgeous patrons for keeping the teapot full and for helping me to keep my podcast ad-free. If you'd like to join them to get ad-free versions of these podcast videos, go to patreon.com forward slash Emma Newman. If you'd just like to buy me a nice cup of tea, go to ko-fi.com forward slash Emma Newman. Thank you. But yeah, parasocial relationships are weird and scary. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been kind of hiding as well, because there's always the worry that something like that is going to happen from the opposite direction that will be too intense. But also, there's a little bit of discomfort on my part in terms of like the whole the whole weirdness of being an author where you go and do events and you talk on panels and the unspoken thing underneath all of this is that you're you're hoping that you come across as interesting enough or knowledgeable enough or funny enough whatever enough that somebody in the somebody in the audience might decide to read your book or that somebody in the audience who has already read your book feels happy that they've done that and you're not an awful person <laughs> i don't know i don't know it's just weird and it just makes me feel strange because when i started writing and when i got published i remember being just so shocked and freaked out by the fact that I then had to go and do promotion and absolutely appalled at the idea that my picture was going to go into the back of a book. And I was just like, no, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want anything like that because the book is what I can put out into the world. That is, that is so much of me. It's not all me, obviously, because there are characters that are awful and think and say awful things that I absolutely would never say. But it's something I made. It came from me. And that's what I'm putting into the world. It feels weird and unnatural and kind of horrible to have myself become part of that process. Maybe I shouldn't be talking about this as maybe this is just revealing far too much about how screwed up I am. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let me talk about something else. So uh, I want to tell you about something which gives me such a deep, deep, nerdy delight every week. <laughs> Here's something obscure and niche for you. The Met Office in the UK 
So the meteorological service uh, that, that do all of the weather stuff, they, on YouTube, have a weekly deep dive and it's about 20 to 30 minutes long and they talk about something topical in the weather and then explain the science behind it. And by the science behind it, I mean things like how they um, gather data and how they um, interpret modelling data and also things like this is how a hurricane starts or this is why this particular storm was so powerful. This is how we predict these things. This is the range of possibilities. And that's why sometimes we can't always predict a certain type of weather well. Here are things happening on the other side of the globe that are influencing the weather in the UK this week. I love it. I love it so much. I just find it really interesting. I, as I think part of being a writer, but also just, I've always been this way. I'm just constantly deeply curious about everything. And being able to have a thing that I can watch that satisfies my curiosity about the weather is, is something that gives me a, a huge amount of joy. So I recommend it. And of course, you know, I am totally reinforcing the stereotype of a British person who wants to talk about the weather, but it, it is one of the best conversation icebreakers we have as a really repressed and socially awkward nation. I can't express how valuable it is to have weather which is constantly changing and being unpredictable for huge swathes of the year to be able to talk to somebody about that. It's, it's the universal topic. And so if, like me, you're kind of curious about why things happen the way they do in terms of the weather, you can watch it. And um, I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> What's another thing I want to talk about today? I want to talk about the Banshees of Inishirin, which I finally saw. It was a few months ago that I saw it. Ah, oh, I loved it. And I know that not everybody likes that movie. And that's the same with all movies, right? Um, but it really, really moved me. I absolutely adore that film. I love the humour. I love the subject matter. I love that it's one of those movies that is about what is happening on the screen, but is also about much, much, much deeper things. And, you know, you could argue that lots of films are like that, but this really did feel like it had something to say. And it was heartbreaking. And sometimes heartbreaking and hilarious at the same time, which was really weird. But great, fantastic performances. And just, just wonderful. I really loved it. If you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. I thought it was so refreshing as well. It feels like I hadn't seen a film like that for such a long time. Something that was small in scale and personal and that had stakes which were incredibly high for the people there. I mean, they, they couldn't be higher, but they had nothing to do with saving the world or some big threat or making sure that something happened or not, it was so intimate and beautiful. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I thoroughly recommend it. Something else that I have been nerding out about lately is aquaponics. I love it. I just love the idea of having a closed system where, and I, I mean in terms of water, where at one point in the system you have fish that you are keeping and the waste from the fish goes into the water, the nutrients from their waste goes to feed plants that you grow and harvest without having to add fertiliser. And it's a 
really efficient way to grow plants in terms of water use as well, because it's a closed system. And there is just something so elegant about it, which I really love. I saw this brilliant um, YouTube, I think it was PBS. I think PBS Terror is a series. Mm, I, I should have looked this up before I talked about it, shouldn't I? Um, I will put a link. I will put a link in the show notes um, to this video. And it's about this uh, woman in New York who is running an aquaponics farm, like in Brooklyn, I think it is. It was a few weeks ago I saw it. And in this very, very urban environment has this incredibly lush urban farm, um, all being fertilised by fish. Brilliant. I love stuff like that. Makes me really happy. Right, I think that's probably enough burbling for this episode. I hope you have an excellent week. I hope that at some point between now and the next episode, you make yourself a drink that just warms you perfectly. Whether that's a cup of tea that you drink at the exact moment where it is still hot, but not too hot. I, I wish that upon you if you're a tea drinker. If you're not a tea drinker, the most smooth, beautiful cup of coffee or hot chocolate, whatever, whatever it is, I hope that between now and the next time you hear my voice, you have a drink of something that just makes you go, oh, that was lovely. Take care, my lovelies. Bye. You've just listened to an episode of Tea and Sanctuary. If you enjoyed the show and would like to be an absolute bless poppet, you can help to keep the teapot full and the podcast ad-free by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Emma Newman. If you'd just like to buy me a nice cup of tea, go to ko-fi.com forward slash Emma Newman. This episode was brought to you by four cups of tea, a small pie, and a rhyming couplet passed down ten generations. Go forth, my pretty cupcakes, and be lovely to each other.